Land Use Committee on the um, 17th of, or 18th of September to uh, order. Thank you all for being here uh, at Carnegie and thank you for being on channel 16 also. Uh, our agenda is uh, in front of you. Uh, the approval of the first item is approval of the minutes of uh, August 21st, 2012. Do I hear uh, a motion to approve? So move, Anderson. Second, Karski. Uh, all in favor, aye. 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 No, no, nobody against, so uh, they are approved. We have some, uh, we have open discussion to start out with first. Uh, is there anything to be brought for open discussion from the council members or from the committee members? Hearing none, let's get started with uh, vicious dog ordinance uh, revision. We have, um, as you remember, we have two, uh, two ordinances that we were brought to us last time. And we had the, um, we had, as I remember, we had the uh, we had police officer here to uh, to talk to us about it, and um, <clears throat> we talked mostly about this being more of a problem with the ant with the owners than it was with the, um, the of, with the owners than it was with the uh, specific breeds, and so um, I'm wondering if uh, anyone has. Uh, a motion to bring or has a favorite of one of these uh, of one of these or if anybody would like to uh, speak to it in the audience council oh, dean yes uh, counselor we've got two um, ordinances here and or two proposed changes to our ordinance yes. um i guess i'd like to know from our legal, what is the germane differences between the two? Is there a significant difference? Uh, our city attorney and assistant city attorney are in, in there. Um, I know you probably don't have them in front of you. Would you mind taking, if we got them to you, would you mind taking uh, five minutes with us? And, because they're only a couple pages long. Councilor Rolfing, uh, Keith Allenstein of our office has been He's working on this, and I frankly, uh, uh, in the beauty of delegation, I do not know <laughs> and cannot comment on this one. I apologize. Mr. Oh. Chair? Yes. Can I just go ahead and move that we defer this to our next uh, uh, land use committee meeting when uh, Mr. Allenstein can be here? Could I would second that. Okay. I guess I was assuming that he was going to be here. And uh, he would have uh, given us a little uh, counseling on it. Would uh, Mr. Fifeley? Would you make sure he's here at this next one? I would. Um, I've, I have motion on the on the floor to um, defer to our next meeting. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay. We have uh, our next order of business is a country club ordinance. Uh, Jeff, you're here for it, and if you would uh, please uh, give us an update of what you've uh, come up with. This is an item that's been before the Land Use Committee, um, and I've put together a quick little presentation for you. Currently, there's no definition for country clubs within the zoning ordinance. Um, as we're moving forward, golf courses with clubhouses are defined within the zoning ordinances. The second section is their allowed land uses are defined. So we do allow certain land uses within the zoning districts, such as there's golf courses with clubhouses are allowed currently. The third issue that we've continued to look at and being trying to address are what are the accessory uses that are currently allowed and then what we're trying to address is what accessory uses should be allowed within golf courses. That's what's continued to come before this body, is that there's golf courses which are allowed in the, in the zoning ordinances. Golf courses have clubhouses which are allowed in the RC district, and then what types of accessory uses should be at golf courses. So my solution is to define what a clubhouse is. We should allow certain uses within golf course clubhouses, and the course of action would then be to Again, bring it forward to land use, which we're doing today. Bring it forward to the Planning Commission and the City Council. 
This is the fourth time that we've been to land use. We were back in September of 2011, in 2012, and 20, um, July of 2012. Again, all kind of going through the same process. Background, there's very numerous um, golf courses within the city of Sioux Falls. We have two country clubs. We have a couple of private country club or golf courses, excuse me, and some private um, golf courses. All of these golf courses have clubhouses with parking lots and accessory uses. So again, as defined, we have a golf course. This is in the existing ordinance right now. A golf course is attractive land for playing golf, improved with tees, greens, fairways, and hazards, which may include clubhouse and shelters. Is it the intent that we, we as staff know what's allowed within the clubhouse? Or, when I'm asking land use, without that definition for clubhouse and golf course clubhouses, would we be allowed pro shops, dining, banquets, and allowed on-sell alcohol, off-sell alcohol accessory? So that's really the question that's in front of land use and city council. Is it the intent that we as staff know what's allowed at a golf, golf course clubhouse, or if not, we need to define that and lay out specifically what's within a clubhouse? So what I'm proposing in the ordinance and in front of you as land use today is to get rid of club. We don't really have clubs in the city of Sioux Falls, but to have two definitions for clubhouses. Clubhouse A, Clubhouse B. A clubhouse at a golf course, okay, is a building or area used in association with a golf course, which includes social, dining, eating, and banquet facilities, and wellness activities, tennis and swimming. Operators of these clubhouses may also render services customarily carried out as a business, but incidental, incidental to that club, that golf course, including <laughs> retailing, full service restaurants, on-sale establishments and off-sale establishments without drive-up windows. B is the same, except <coughs> it does not include off-sale. Hmm. Discussion. we see definition B, please? Absolutely. Again, they're the same definitions. The clubhouse is a building in association with a club, with a golf course, and they have social and wellness activities. The operators would have um, services that are incidental to the golf courses, and this is what it really comes, what should clubhouses have? And we can change however you see fit. You list incidental including and, and that's where the list starts and stops, including wherever you want to start and stop that list. <coughs> What's allowed at a clubhouse? And again, I just, I'm not a golfer, so, but there are people that golf and they, what, what is currently allowed at a golf course clubhouse? They have a pro shop, that's retail. They have restaurants. They have on sale alcohol, that's B. And the request currently is, can we also add <coughs> off-sale without a drive-up? Yes, Councillor Koski. Um, talk to me um, when we go to the definition for golf course, and I'm, you're asking the question of us. Is the intent that we know what's allowed within a clubhouse or without the definition, where do we go if we don't have a definition? Excellent question. Okay. Okay. Um, and I will not put the attorneys on this issue, okay? Because planning and zoning has to do this every single day. When issues come before us, if it's not in the code, it's not allowed. And that's how we've tried to handle it in the past. When you look at this, a golf course has the ability to do golf and a clubhouse. So, when you get push comes to shove, can they do these things at a golf course? That's where we really got stuck in this situation. They came to us and they asked right up and they said, can we do alcohol? No, you can't. So are we gonna go back to all those golf courses and say, you can't have pro shops. It doesn't list there. You can't have retailing, you can't have dining, you can't have hot dog stands, you can't have 
they're not listed. They're not allowed uses. Or was it the intent that, yeah, these, well, that's the slippery slope where not only with golf courses, but everything else that we have, we try to look at the, what's in the definitions and say, it's listed. This is what's allowed. If it's not listed, it's not allowed. So it's definitely would behoove us to define it. Yes. Okay. And we have the A and B to choose from. And or, um, do mm -hmm. we want, as a, as a committee here, Council Rolfing, do we want to choose between A and B? Is that what we're faced with right now? Or do we? With B being <coughs> what I understood what they're doing today. Okay. B okay. is what I understand that they're doing now. I mean, retailing is what we call, I mean, I wasn't going to put down pro shop because it's retailing. And it's a full service restaurant. At any golf course, they have a full service restaurant. Okay. And they serve alcohol. Councilor Anderson. Jeff, when you first brought this to us, it was um, brought to us for basically the purposes of a country club correct. requesting this. And it wasn't actually the country club requesting it, it was members. Is that correct? Oh, no, it was administration operators. And they had asked the question, if we go all the way back to the minutes, they had said, can we do these things? I said, it's always been a problem. These things are not allowed. They're not defined. And we were trying to, A, define it, B, put it in the zoning district, and C, list what accessory uses. That's the same thing I'm doing now. Define it, put it in the zoning classification, and then list what the accessory uses are. So it's, it's been that same discussion. Now I'm just trying to simplify it and say, and we're still not going to call it, it's not a country club, it's a golf course. It's going to be all golf courses. They're, they're just golf that, courses. Whether public or private, private or, will all have off-sale liquor opportunities. Yes, which is what I w the intent was before. I'd always worked with, with the Sioux Falls Parks Department. If it was Keene or Elmwood, it was the ability to be a country club. They could still do all of these things because they could have came in and said, yeah, we're a country club. That's fine. They would have been defined as a country club. They would have been able to do on sale, off sale, full service. We would have defined them, allowed them in a zoning classification, and listed their uses. But as of right now, they are not a country club. They are a golf course. Correct. As, as, as defined right here, this is what they are. Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes. Councilor Staggers. Uh, I move that the committee accept definition A. I would second that. And the reason I'd second that is I know there's some controversy with the off sale um, drive or the off sale sale of alcohol, but I guess I would like that to be considered by the full council, not just by this committee. Do I have any other comments? Any further discussion? I have, um, I, like your, I like your comment, Councillor Con Karski, about uh, having um, um, the discussion on the full council. And I will bring up at that time the idea that this would still allow them to set up a, a um, basically a liquor store inside the, uh, inside the country clubs, which I firmly oppose. Um, but uh, let's, let the, let's let the full council um, deal with that a little bit. I, I like what you've done here, Jeff. That's very good. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And um, I, I still have a problem with, the, with that idea. Now, Councilor Anderson, you had another uh, comment. <clears throat> I guess to mirror your comments, uh, Councilor Rolfing, uh, I feel the same way also. Um, since I've heard this ideal, uh, our community and neighborhoods struggle with alcoholism and alcohol-related problems. Uh, we hear it from the county almost daily, how they're struggling financially be because of alcohol problems. And I just feel that this is beyond what uh, should be utilized in our public courses or private courses. Um, but I do believe also that this is something that should be a full city council discussion. So um, if we do that, I guess I would like to make sure that the council has both uh, items to choose from, not just discuss one. So if I would make a motion, I would move that we move this entire discussion to the city council without a 
recommendation of A or B. Are you, how would I do that? Make a, okay, yeah. we have, a, we have a, a motion and a second. So I wasn't there a motion and a second off of Councilor Stagger's right. original one. So yeah. that first needs to be voted upon. Mm -hmm. Can he do a substitute motion? He can do a substitute motion. Okay. Would you like to make that a substitute motion? I would like to make that a substitute motion. And yes. your substitute motion would be to substitute both A and B be brought to the full council. Correct. Councilor Staggers, would you allow that to be the substitute motion? I have no choice. Yes, because with a substitute motion, he, has, he gets that. Um, uh oh, do I just vote on that then? If it's not second, second, it doesn't go through. It needs a second, I guess. It would need a oh, second. We'll need a second. <laughs> Hearing no second, we're back to the um, original motion of, um, of uh, definition A being brought to the uh, council. I would suggest that if you would like to have Councilor um, Anderson's uh, motion be done that uh, you would vote in a negative way so that then that another motion could be made and we could vote on that. But I guess maybe you've already done that. So, um, a comment? Yes, you may. I guess by doing it this way, by just having the one definition, it would be very easy for the full council to um, amend this motion or this option to, and just remove the off sale. Right. portion of that so or add something if I may add something uh, establishing a little more uh, rigidity to the kind of sales off uh, or off sales that could be used in a uh, uh, in a country club so uh, yes we could go that way too and as mr. Smith has uh, stated we do need to come up with a definition too yeah. so at, at, at the very least there needs to be some type of definition stated for these organizations um, would okay let's uh, we'll have a vote on um, Councilor Stagger's uh, uh, recommendation to the co full council of um, uh, definition a for clubhouse um, all in favor aye 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 Oppo aye opposed aye <laughs> motion passes three to one um, do we then uh, Jeff do we need to uh, vote on the definition of, a, of the golf course then too. Does that change the resolution? That doesn't change the law at all. That's the way it is right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the way the golf course is set up right now, it's already defined. So the only thing we were looking at is the definition of that clubhouse. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That will be uh, then, ladies and gentlemen, brought before the full council. Uh, can you tell me about when, Denise? As I had up in the slide, it has to go land use. This is a zoning issue, so it has to go to the Planning Commission. Planning Commission will send it forward with a recommendation to City Council. I think it, Planning Commission's next meeting that they can get on the agenda will be November 4th or 7th, so it will be November 20th. Okay. Around that time frame. Thank you much. Yep. Okay. Our next item, our next item of agenda on the agenda is due process with Paul Bingford. Paul, um, thank you very much for being here. I know we've kind of, uh, this is a tough one to deal with, but, and uh, we won't put you on too much of a spot, but we probably will. <laughs> Counselors, thank you for an opportunity to speak to you tonight. Paul Bingford with <laughs> Assistant City Attorney. The reason uh, that I asked to be on the, the agenda today is there were some discussions that, that I saw on the August 14th, 2012 City Council meeting when, it, uh, when the issue of assessments came up. And there were issues that, uh, that arose in reference to due process rights and, and, and how the city handles those. I want to talk briefly about due process in general and then try to, to more specifically talk about what the city has done recently in reference to due process rights on administrative appeals process and, uh, and, and some of the issues that were addressed on the, at the August 14th meeting. Uh, in reference to due process, just from a general standpoint, um, the United States Constitution 5th and 14th Amendments deal with uh, due process. We certainly need to follow the U.S. Constitution as well as Article 6, Section 2 of the South Dakota Constitution. And generally when we're, we're talking about it in the administrative appeals process, we're talking about procedural due process, which is the process that's used to arise, or arrive at a decision. Uh, generally before we take property, uh, we need to give notice of what we intend to do, why, and give an opportunity to object. Now that's different than the substantive issue about whether or not the city is doing the correct thing. The, the, the issue is procedurally are we giving uh, individuals an opportunity to, to object 
and, and bring their objections uh, in an appropriate forum. Basic elements of due process are notice and an opportunity to be heard at a meaningful time and in a meaningful manner. So that's what we're all striving to accomplish. Specific to code enforcement, purpose of due process is to let the landowner or occupant know of a pending action so that they can make an informed decision about whether they to agree with that decision by the city, contest the decision, or, or whether they need to, uh, to uh, contest that decision by the city. Um, the city of Sioux Falls has, has always had concerns in reference to due process, and this isn't a, a new issue. Uh, and, and before Mr. Fifeley was a city attorney, uh, certainly Justice Amundsen and, and, and Gary Caldwell and other city attorneys have, have done what they can to, to strengthen and work toward uh, improving the procedural due process rights that the citizens of Sioux Falls have. Most recently, and, and, and I'm talking about in reference to over the last year or year and a half, there was a significant modifications made to the administrative appeal process. Um, some of those major modifications, and, and primarily when I started with the city in November of 2010, uh, Mr. Fifley was working on some substantial modifications when I arrived, and, and we continued to work on those after I got here. The burden of proof was, uh, was placed on the city. That was the, the previous ordinance was silent to that. Uh, the individual or party cited uh, now by the ordinance has the right to call witnesses, cross-examine witnesses, subpoena witnesses or documents. Um, the city doesn't issue additional citations while an action is pending or while an appeal is pending. If someone has an argument with how the city is uh, or wants to appeal a decision of the city, citations are, are put in abeyance and no further citations are issued until that issue is resolved. Additionally, we try to, to strengthen the, the ability to, to preserve the record of what happens at that hearing. Something as, as simple as we now use a digital recording um, rather than the, the previous method, just so that, that we can preserve the, the hearing in, in a better manner. The other change that is made is we now have two independent administrative hearing officers. Um, those were selected through an RFP process, uh, interviewed by uh, a former magistrate judge, uh, human, uh, human resources, city council was, was involved in that, a, a member of the city council at the time, uh, Councilor Brown was involved in the process, and they selected two hearing officers, uh, Dustin DeBoer and Michelle Christman, who are both attorneys in town. Michelle Christman was, uh, was a magistrate for a period of time in, in the city of Sioux Falls also. It used to be that three directors could also be involved in the process, um, and although they, they did a, a great job and handled it well, just from appearance standpoint, uh, it's now all the hearings go in front of a, a lawyer uh, who is licensed in the city, and, and part of what we're doing there is to, to, to give citizens confidence in the opinion and in the, uh, in the independent nature of those who are making the decision. Now, after those decisions were put in place, or after the, the new ordinance was put in place in July of 2011, there was still a, an issue there because in terms of citizens who wanted to appeal a decision from, uh, from the administrative appeal hearing officer had to file either a writ of certiori or a writ of prohibition before they could get that matter in front of circuit court. Uh, again, Mr. Fifley worked with the South Dakota Municipal uh, late worked with South Dakota Municipal Association, and they drafted language modifying a state statute, Chapter 1-26, to allow direct appeals from the city administrative appeal process to circuit court. That just went into effect on July 1st of this year, so we haven't had any appeals that have, been, that have gone through that process yet, uh, because it's still, uh, it's still new to the books. But there was no enabling legislation that previously allowed that. Now it specifically says in state law that an appeal from a final decision, ruling, or action rendered by an administrative appeals process adopted by a home rule municipality shall be appealed to circuit court in which the home rule municipality uh, is located. Previously, there was enabling legislation that allowed people to appeal uh, from the Zoning Board of Adjustments to, to circuit court, but not from the administrative appeals process. So that is another step that has been taken to, to strengthen the process. Uh, additionally, and, and what you'll, you'll see repeatedly in reference to due process is wanting 
making sure that citizens feel that the process is fair. They may not always agree with the decision, but feel that the process is fair. And the code enforcement uh, managers and staff, uh, Ron Bell, Dean Lanier, uh, Kevin Smith, Luann Ford, Shauna Goldhammer, Matt Nelson, I think do an excellent job of that. The fact that 88% of notice of violations that are issued are, are dealt with before it even gets to a citation or court process, I think speaks to uh, the concern that they have for citizens, the concern that's had for property rights within the city. Our, our percentages were good in terms of compliance before. It was 85% last year, but increased even further this year to 88%. Um, the city doesn't want to fine people. It doesn't want to abate nuisances on its own. What we try to do through the process is encourage uh, owners of property to, to take care of the issues themselves, to address the issues so that we don't have to get involved and we don't have to issue fines uh, and do those things. Now, there's always going to be a certain percentage of people who disagree with what the city's doing and disagree with the, with the process. And, and, and those cases tend to take substantially more time to, to get through the system. Uh, a lot of that is because of the due process rights that, that are allowed. I want to talk more specifically about assessments and how this issue came up. Um, and, and, and looking at the, the, the meeting minutes from the city council meeting on August 14th, there was over an hour of discussion uh, between all of the, the individuals who came up. There were assessments for trees, nuisance vegetation, health, building services, and snow removal. I, I did find it interesting in reviewing that video of, that of over the 200 uh, assessments that were issued, there were no citizens who came in to complain about the assessments that they received. Um, and, and, you know, there were over 100 and some on nuisance vegetation, 10 for health, 6 for building services, 13 for snow removal. And all of those people were, uh, were notified of the fact that the assessments would be in front of the city council and none of them came to object. So I think that that also speaks well for the due process rights that are given to the citizens and and the ability that citizens had to come in here, even though none of them chose to do so on that particular, uh, that particular day. Some of the specifics that were brought up that night, and, and I kind of want to address those, I, I know there was the issue of, of vegetation and, and the weeds and, and the city going on property and, and, and mowing property when it gets over eight inches tall or when, uh, or when there's noxious weeds. State law addresses the issue of, of what's required. Uh, it indicates that in order for us to have the ability to go onto the property and abate the nuisance, we need to publish uh, twice in the official newspaper for the, the city that the city of Sioux Falls expects you to, to mow your grass and, and to take care of your noxious weeds. Uh, and and that, that is published twice every spring. That is also in our city ordinances. Now, there were discussions about a letter that was sent by the city at that time because the city on the first violation sends a, a letter to the, to the homeowner uh, or the landowner indicating that you have seven days to, to correct this violation, the, the grass is growing, it's over eight inches or, or the weeds are too high, and if you don't abate that nuisance, we'll hire somebody to, to go in and take care of it. Actually, that was the majority of the, uh, of the assessments that, that came before you on August 14th was in reference to nuisance vegetation. I think there were some issues raised about, is it enough to send a letter once? I mean, should we be doing it more than once? First of all, I would tell you that under state law and, and our ordinances, we go above and beyond what is required there because all that is required is that we give notice uh, in, in the paper on those two particular occasions. The reality of the situation is, uh, and, and I think that this is, is why the law is as it is, if you live in South Dakota, you generally know that vegetation grows between April and, and October. And so it shouldn't be a surprise to landowners that if they have vegetation on their property, it's growing. However, just to show that, I mean, we continue to try to improve the due process and, and the notification we give to people. Councilor Rolfing, you had mentioned on that particular night on August 14th, that, you know, if we only send that one notice, do we have language in there that indicates that that's the only notice they're going to receive? Um, and, and we didn't at that time. Uh, but one week later on August 21st, and for the letters that have been sent out since then, they contain in bold an extra sentence that indicates this is the only notice you'll receive. And I don't remember the exact words, but this is the only notice you'll receive. You're on notice that you need to continue to, to mow your vegetation and to take care of your yards. That was, that's a perfect example of, 
of, of extra steps that doesn't take a lot of extra effort by the city. It's just one extra sentence. We put it into the form letter. And, and actually, I have one of those letters being handed to me. It indicates in bold, subsequent violations will be remedied by the city without sending additional courtesy reminder letters. Please continue to monitor your property throughout the year and ensure that your property remains in compliance. So that is now included in the letter that goes out. Again, that letter in and of itself is a courtesy. It's, it's more than, than what we believe due process requires in that case. And what due process is required also depends on you know, what, what property right are we talking about. You know, if, if you're talking about taking the extra, you know, if your grass is 10 inches, the city going in and taking the extra two inches or four inches of your grass, it's a more minimal requirement there. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we do that with a, with a seven day notice and with the publication in the paper. If we're talking about taking someone's house because of building services issues, uh, because the, the foundation is crumbling or those types of things, that's done under a notice and order and that's an 18 month process. So depending on what the property interest that we are taking from people, whether that be grass or whether that be, you know, removing a structure from a premises, that due process changes. Uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, recognizes and identifies the issue that, you know, I, I prosecuted for 15 years and so it was liberty interest that I was dealing with at that time. And so there's a, a significant amount of due process that's required before you can send somebody to jail or, 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 or search their premises for drugs or, or those types of things. We certainly want to comply with the due process requirements and we try to go above and beyond what's required. But depending on the property interest that is, that is at issue, uh, there are, uh, are different procedures that are necessary for us to follow. And I guess that's from a general standpoint. What I would let you know, I'm more than happy to answer any specific questions or, or, or answer any concerns that anybody may have in reference to due process. Thank you, Paul, very much. Um, are there any questions or anything? Uh, Councilor Staggers. Yes. Um, my <clears throat> recollection of that meeting was uh, the primary focus was like, for example, with the um, mowing of the yard. Okay, let's suppose you have a yard that's not in compliance, it's 10 inches, and you get notified about that. But then, like you just pointed out, well, subsequent violations, we're not going to tell you about it. Sure. Okay, so what if it's seven and a half inches and you get it, you know, I mean, you, you don't have any opportunity to challenge or anything at all. It's kind of like, okay, uh, we caught you speeding, we've notified you of that. Uh, in the future, uh, if we see you speeding, we're not going to notify you about that, but we're going to give you a ticket anyway. Sure. You have no way to challenge. So, and, and I understand that. In reference to, in reference to the weed ordinance, um, you can certainly challenge the citation that is issued to you when you, uh, when you don't mow. And citations are issued for that. So when you're talking about, yes, we go out and mow, but there's also a citation that, that accompanies that. You can appeal the citation, and if you disagree with the decision of the Administrative Appeal Hearing Officer now as of July 1st, you could appeal that decision further to Supreme Court. Additionally, if you didn't want to take that route, you could appear in front of the City Council once a year when they do the assessments and, and raise any issues you have there. So there's actually two methods that people would have to appeal that process. The one that would deal most directly with the issue of weeds would be to follow the, the procedure of, a, of, of appealing the citation and then going in front of the hearing officer and if you disagree with that decision going to circuit court but there's also an opportunity to appeal the assessment if if, if somebody wants to come in before you and say hey, hey look I my grass was only seven inches long and the city came in and mowed it and you shouldn't be charging me for it that's a decision that the city council can make at that time whether uh, whether that uh, whether that amount of that assessment is going to stay or whether that's something that you're going to get rid of for that individual but that's months after the city mows, and you're coming before the city council trying to convince the city council. No, it was seven and a half inches, and the city was, well, I mean, how you, it's very, very, very difficult. And I guess what I'm saying is, you know, the city should have the decency, if they're going to give you a, a fine to, to you know, let you know at the time when they're going to be doing that. Sure. And, and I appreciate that. And, 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 you know, under that, Councilor Staggers, I would, I would indicate that the only reason you'd be in front of the City Council objecting to the uh, assessment is if you didn't follow up on the appellate rights that you would have initially when you received the citation. And our citations themselves indicate the time frame you have to appeal and, and how you would proceed on that. So if, if somebody chose not to appeal the citation at that time, but then nine months later when they 
when they were here for the assessment, uh, decided they wanted to appeal at that time, it would give them a, a second bite at the apple, so to speak. But I guess I can also see we're getting bogged down in due process here. Why don't we just make it really simple at the beginning instead of going through a lot of this unnecessarily, I guess is what I would be saying. In, in terms of, and, I, and I'm sorry, Counselor, in terms of making it simple. Yeah, if, if um, somebody uh, uh, sees it, believes that your grass is over eight inches, and uh, at that time, you say, hey, you're gonna get a ticket for this. No, you can contest right away and say, no, it's only seven and a half inches. Let's just go outside and measure it. Okay. Instead of going through all of this sure. necessarily. And, and I understand what you're talking about, but we also have to keep in mind the realities of the situation. If your property is owned by a California corporation, um, you, you know, it's, it's not always practical to, to contact the California Corporation, have them come and look at the property, see how many inches it is, uh, whether, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of properties that we mow, and not all of them, are properties that are in foreclosure, properties that are in default, properties that are vacant. Um, and, and, and so those are also factors that we need to, to consider in terms of, uh, of what we need to do from, from a due process right. Th there's no question that um, there's always issues about what you can do and whether there's more, mm -hmm. but, but it's a balancing test. There is a, a, a 1976 uh, U.S. Supreme Court case called Matthews, Matthews versus Eldridge that our South Dakota Supreme Court has cited. And in terms of procedural due process issues, there are three factors that are looked at for a balancing test in terms of how much due process is, is needed. And we try to look carefully at that on every decision that we are making in terms of how we handle weed enforcement, in terms of how we handle bringing down houses, and we try to comply the best we can with that 1976 U.S. Supreme Court decision. Um, if, if the city council believes that more notice is needed in certain areas, uh, we, can, uh, we can certainly continue to work on that, much like we did when, when Councilor Rolfing recommended a, a word change in the letter, and we can certainly continue to work on those issues, Councilor. Councilor Karski. Paul, I appreciate you being here today to discuss this with us because it, I think it's only right that we afford our citizens true due process. And you know, when it comes to these assessments, they, it, it is up to the people to come to us to talk about it. What I look at this is ignorance of the law is no excuse. How many times have we heard that? The first violation, we're telling the people what our city ordinances are. We're giving them the chance to correct it. Uh, the second and third and subsequent times, we're just taking care of it. We've already made them aware of what our ordinances are. I think what gets lost in this too often is it's not the person that's violating that city ordinance on mowing their lawn. The true people that suffer are the neighbors that have to put up with continued and repeated violations of that, and they're looking at um, lawns that aren't cared for, trees that are overgrown, whatever it is, and they, they're the ones that their property values decline and that type of thing. So again, I appreciate you being here. I just wanted to make sure that we are affording due process. And from what I've heard, I, I'm relatively comfortable that we are and that people do have the means to address it. Okay. Thank you, Council. Any other comments? I will make one, and I, I think, Jeff, um, <clears throat> if in Councilor Sager's um, uh, scenario there, the first time we go out, is it is it literally measured, the grass, or is it just guessed at, or can you, it's, it's literally measured, and then the, and then the, and then the uh, letter goes out. So there's no doubt that it's over eight or 10 inches long, and, uh, and then, they, then they get the idea they should know at that point that, uh, how long it is, and yeah, that kind of thing. So that should help from that standpoint too, Councilor Sagers, I would think. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it very much, uh, the two of you. Thank you. Okay, next on the line, uh, shapes and places, zoning ordinance amendments from uh, Jeff. Sam, are you going to be giving most of this one? Yes. Jeff gets to do the next one. So. Okay. Sam Trebelcock, City of Sioux Falls Planning Office. Um, in the essence of time, obviously, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, but I do want to give you guys an update what we've been doing uh, since the last time we met. Um, what's important here is to get back to the public involvement plan. As we are just talking about uh, here in the last presentation that Paul gave, um, 
due process is really important for what we're doing in zoning too, and not only the process that we have, but also uh, not just what's even required by state law, but we wanted to go above and beyond, way above and beyond that. Um, so the process that we're looking at here is including as many opportunities as possible. Uh, yesterday we had our second um, study group meeting, uh, 15 to 20 people that were uh, very dedicated individuals that serve on the study group spent an hour and a half with us discussing different ways that we could get some of those opportunities out to, to the public and discussing where we need to be able to go. I just want to give you, you know, where we're at now. We are at a point in the time where we're, we're, we're ready to roll out that full or ordinance. Now the thing is when you roll out the full ordinance, obviously everybody doesn't want to look at the full ordinance and I'll show you why of that is in a second. So we're going to give other ways that you can interact and interface with that ordinance, um, whether or not it's through an executive summary or looking at just what are, what are the, the changes um, or um, another different, uh, another way that we can show you how you can interface with that ordinance. In October, we're going to bring out the zoning map, a draft of that, and then we're going to spend some time um, discussing in November, December, what changes need to be made and what other opportunities for public comment do we need to look at. Again, what is shape places? It's an update of the 1983 ordinances, um, the 1983 zoning ordinances. And the main goals that we have with this update are more development options, consistent predictable regulations, new or innovative site planning options, and lastly, a user-friendly format. Again, opportunities for review, and I can't stress that enough. How can we do that? Um, would love to have your guys', uh, uh, the councils, um, what you think we should be doing in terms of opportunities for review. We're having the study group meetings. Um, we had, one, like I mentioned, one yesterday. Uh, we'll have press conferences announcing uh, the full ordinance, the zoning map, other changes that we make. We'll have an open house or open houses. Um, any request for pre presentations by any groups that would like us to, whether it's on parts or all of the ordinance, we'll do that. Um, so we'll get that information out to the public. Review on the web. We're going to have lots of information on the web on that. And then any other ways that you feel is necessary and important to do, we'll also you know, get it out um, in that way. Opportunities for co comment, of course, at the open house, through email, any way we can, at the study group meetings, um, during your meetings here at Land Use Committee, at City Council, Planning Commission. Requested presentations will take comment. Uh, any other ways that we can come up with there, we'd love to, to hear uh, methods that we can do that. Now, what, what, what we're suggesting is that the zoning, we're going to bring up a couple of different ways to, and we'll put this on the web here by the end of the week, is what we're planning for. Um, the, um, we're going to first uh, put it out an interface, a zoning district interface that's based on the forms, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like at the end of, end of the presentation. That'll be on the web. So you can actually look at um, a summary of all of the different zoning districts and the forms and uses that are available and that will give you a good indication of what the regulations are overall based on those different zoning districts. Um, that could also be done uh, through, uh, through the zoning uses too. And um, that's another way we'll look at it. You could either look at it through the forms or through the uses. Uh, there's six pages of what we'll call the big changes or it's kind of um, also we're looking at even a, as we talked yesterday, kind of a two page executive summary. Um, there's a summary of all the changes that I just did. It's 18 pages and then, <clears throat> excuse me, about 27 pages of uh, uh, the definitions and conditional use standards. <clears throat> excuse me. The full ordinance, um, which is underlined in st the strikeouts, so that's the full th things that have changed throughout, is 494 pages. It's huge. It's huge. So you'd say you probably don't most people want to review it in that manner. So that's why we're, we're looking at this option. Now, I wanted to take a step back. People wondered, does anybody know how long the ordinance is now? 
Anybody? Uh -huh. How many pages? The zoning ordinances now? Today? Too long? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, it's, it's 315 pages right now as we format it. It's 315. Now, this is with the under strike stri strikeouts. When you take the strikeouts out, the new ordinance will now be 271 pages, so we're down, mainly because we've um, taken out a lot of the planned development districts, regulations, the overlay districts, and things like that. So we have tried to find ways to streamline this somewhat, as much as we can. Now, the, the other thing that we're taking out, as you remember my last presentation, is there's three other books about the same size as the 271 pages of PDs, district regulations. With this ordinance, all those will go away. So those will all be conventionalized districts. So that's another way to look at the way we're trying to streamline things. Um, of course, another way to meth we're trying to get it out there, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it up through staff presentations. When can we move forward with this? We talked about this in the study group. The goal of the study group, and they agreed with this yesterday, the people that were there, is the goal of the study group is to reach a consensus, consensus that adequate opportunity for comment has been provided and that the group believes the process has been fair. Again, back to due process. Has it been fair? Again, we want to get as much, people say, you've given us the opportunity, you've given us the information that we need, that we want, um, that's good enough. That's what the study group is going to say. When, they're, when they feel like that's gone far enough, then we, we, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys would like to look at it the same way, the council would. Um, so, you know, when has there been enough for opportunity for comment? Now, just real, real quickly, we have districts, forums, and uses, and how do those all play out together? Uh, the districts you're very familiar with are the zoning districts that we have and, and, and are listed on the zoning map. The forums are essentially categories of uses, and everything is um, controlled generally the same way within the forms. And you can see that, well, I'm going to do that up here. These are all the zoning districts that we have with the zoning ordinance listed through um, 29 there. And all the forms, so each one of these, you could, well, you'll have hyperlinks into each one of the forms through this, which we call a zoning interface, and you can look at what's available within each one of those. And uh, some of them um, have a lot less choices than others, um, but I think it's a, a very reflective of the way even it is now, but what we're improving upon is the idea of mixed uses, um, options for additional density, and things of that nature. So that is um, certainly incorporated into this new ordinance. Um, and this is something you'll see as, as an option to, look, to take a look at and, and uh, option to go into the zoning ordinance in this manner. So with that, um, I'll take your questions. Questions for Sam? <clears throat> you sure you aren't taking lessons from uh, Mark? Cotter on this kind of thing? <laughs> We hadn't actually talked about this. Oh, okay. It looks like something Cotter put together. I don't know. I have one, if you guys don't, and that is, um, you know, Urban Ag is working on this this redo of the of the you know farm animals and all this kind of stuff. How do you implement when we come up with our final draft? How are you guys? How how do you implement that into this, or will that be implemented into this then? Um, yeah, it already is, or uh, up to the point that be. you're at. Yeah, and it will be whatever you come up with. But I'll already uh, mentions things on community gardens have been, and anything else that you do okay. will be. It will be. It's a use. Mm -hmm. So you talk about it right now that the districts will allow a use, and so Sam's already built that in right now. Right. So. Okay, so one of the, it'll go to the district and then it'll spread right. out to the, to we're which not, which areas that we've identified will be able to use that and then it'll, it'll One of the things the study group and I think the citizens are really starting to understand is we didn't recreate a lot of these things. We made it a lot user friendly. Right. But there's still districts, there's still uses. And so when we talked about country clubs earlier, 
Okay, there still we're talking about districts and the use. We still have to define them. So when we create a new one, it's still fitting in the same format. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, but I was wondering if I could be excused. I have to uh, get a little more prepared for the city council meeting in just a few minutes, and cool. uh, I'm sorry about my miscalculation no we'll here. How long does it last? Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Well, we thank you very much, Sam, and uh, continue, continue the good work, and we appreciate, we, um, you are um, publicizing, obviously, when these uh, open houses and things are, so yeah, we can we're, be we're looking at early October for that first okay. open house, so you can be looking for that, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Next, uh, sign study group, we're, we're getting, we've gotta be getting to the end of that pretty quick. Right, and you're all busy, and I realize that you have to go forward too. So, but you'd ask me to come back and yep. give you an update on the sign amendments. Um, this is a part of the zoning ordinance. So, part of the 270 pages that Sam talked about, this will be a portion of that. One of the things that we really got across to the study group yesterday is this has already gone through a lot of review. Parking standards have already gone through a full committee. Landscaping standards have already gone full through a full committee. Signage has already gone through a full committee, and now we just have to pick it up and put it in the entire zoning ordinance. So this is just kind of an update of where we're at with signage. Um, the goals, the purpose and intent for what signage is, we have that. Uh, what the sign study group came up with, we had three kind of object objectives that we wanted to do. Shape Sioux Falls, again, is our comprehensive plan. We made sure with landscaping, with parking, with the zoning ordinance, it has to comply with the city's comprehensive plan. Then the study group that came up with a report that came back through land use committee and said, these are the things that we're gonna make sure we wanted to do. I went through today's presentation and checked off. We've done all these things. We haven't necessarily taken care of temporary signs yet, but again, we're checking off everything that we said we were going to do. So, this is kind of where we're at. And Sam mentioned this too, how much do you know about the sign code now? How much do you do, if you're a business owner, you go, I need to get new signage for, no one picks up the sign code now. You go to your sign contractor, the sign contractor comes in. So, a commercial business, how much do you get? That's not really gonna change. You're still gonna go to your sign contractor and go pull up the sign code and they're gonna refer it. So we don't think this is gonna be a big change, but it's gonna be a lot more user-friendly for that end user. So existing ordinance, you need to know what zoning district you're in, what building signage you get, what freestanding signage you get. There's regulations and limitations to that, and there's some exempt signs. The proposal is what zoning district are you in? <laughs> what form do you have? You get building signage, you get freestanding signage, you also get new temporary signage, you also get identification signage. So you get more signage. Um, we discuss, discuss where, how, and when you have signs. That's really what you have to look at. So where is where it's located on the site, how is the type of sign, and when is it permanent or temporary. Um, based upon what Sam put together, this is kind of a quick summary of the amendments. For the forms on the left, the building signage generally stays the same. We have a couple of increases. Freestanding sign, we increased freestanding signs for all of them. And then we added additional signage for the forms and the districts. So that's what the study group recommended. That's what the citizens, the customers wanted. So we wanted to make sure it was predictable and consistent. So this is the format that we've gone through. It's really user friendly before um, when you look at this and again when the user looks at it a b c and d is always going to be the same when you look at the district previously uh, if you look at d it says allow it identification signs you pull up some districts and that might be c on some or sometimes it'd be e now every time you're going to pull it up you can just look at where's my allowed identification signs you can go to that district it's going to be consistent and predictable on where it's at so Again, summary, building signs, it's based upon the street frontage or the building frontage. Freestanding signs, it's based upon your street frontage. Identification signs, residential signage, non-residential, public institutional. Joint tenant signs, these currently, as we discussed with country clubs, they're currently not really allowed, but we've been doing them. We're allowing them in this new zone, zoning code. 
temporary signs, a lot of issues with these, um, a lot of problems. We're allowing them in the new code per not more than 32 square feet, 15 and 30 day periods, and they have to be secured. So we're allowing, that's what we've heard from the public. Um, this is where we always get stuck, okay? Wall signs are fine, uh, freestanding signs are signed. When you get down to it, changeable signs are the ones we have the biggest issues on, banners and window signs. So we've struggled with this for the last six months to a year. This is how it's currently being drafted, the summary. Banners, the ordinance currently calls out 100 square feet. You could get an additional banner signage if you have addition based upon your building or permit allowance. On the left right now, that's, that's way more than ever is allowed, so they get notices, due process citations. We're enforcing that one. On the right-hand side, there is no current definition or standard for how much window signage you get, which is not correct. It's not appropriate. People can just fill their windows full of signage, so the new standard would be you would not have to get a permit for the first 25% and then you can fill up to 50% of your windows, but 100% of windows would not be allowed. That's not appropriate. So we also have a standard now for non-conforming signs. Old signs like this one that people always remember um, could be able to stay in existence. And last but not least, there's an appeal process. Currently, if someone has an objection to how their sign's being addressed or how it's being taken care of, as Paul mentioned, it's not written up into the de definition. We have now put that in the sign code, which will go in the zoning or it's, there's an appeal process and it goes to the Board of Adjustment. Good. And this has gone through the study group. Generally, we have consensus. It's gonna go in the sign or the zoning ordinance and it will go back before Planning Commission and City Council. Que questions? I have one. Yes, sir. It seems to me on, in the traveling that I've done over the country um, that signage is being shrunken down and in the chart that you've seen, and they've been lowered, mm -hmm. and in the chart that I saw, you've expanded the amount of signs that you, you're being, uh, are allowed, and that seems to be um, kind of going against the grain of what's happening around the country. Uh, is that in direct uh, response to what the, uh, what the people have desired? Or what it's they in just direct to. response to what the study group has requested and what I'm bringing forward to this city council. Okay. Are they aware of what a lot of the cities uh, have been doing to... Um... Probably. <laughs> that was a very nice political answer. <laughs> hey, Councilor Anderson. Jeff, how does these changes uh, assist us with some areas that we've struggled with, like uh, out on 41st Street, the Shopco Mall is a great example. With uh, them, uh, at one time, I believe, there was a desire for a standalone sign that would be able to utilize or be utilized by all of the businesses oh, sorry. on that property. For that specific issue, they would now be able to have a joint tenant sign, okay? Joint tenant signs are signs that multiple tenants can put their logos on, okay? That's currently not allowed, but we've done them, and I had an example, up, okay? The but the site one. you're talking about, they wanted to put a sign on someone else's property and advertise their property on someone else's. That's still not allowed and it's not gonna be allowed because right. it's an off-premise sign which is a billboard and handled through a separate code, which is in here, you just have to get an off-premise permit. Okay. So, but, but as far as being right. on the property, multiple tenants can Correct. utilize one. Shopco can say on my sign, Shopco, they could put Shopco and home and plan it, fit in it, whatever, all those tenants they can advertise on their 18th Amendment if Shopco allowed them to. But right now they're saying, no, it's our sign. We're only gonna put our one business on there. Okay, that's, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. you. You're welcome. Question, what would happen if the council came back and said, you know, we want to change the whole profile of the city 
and bring these signs down to um, so we don't have anything over uh, uh, 15 feet high or 20 feet high in the in the deal uh, when in the city when over the next uh, 15 years, 10 either, years. Either now or in the future, we would change it and address that issue. I would not be surprised. Okay, I'm, I'm just, yep. just wondering because it's, it's you know, we've kind of always been known as a, as a, as a sign of cities. And, when we talk about, you know, signs. temporary signs, for example, that's one of the issues that I think at some point the community is gonna come back and say, you know what, yeah, there's citizens, there's customers out there that want window signs and banners and wind feathers and portable signs. At some point, the community is going to come back to you and say, enough's enough, get rid of them. And then we'll go, okay, we went to this extreme, we allowed them, and now we're just going to, but that's not what I'm hearing today from the customers. The customers are saying, allow us more, allow us more. It's a marketing campaign. We need to, we need to keep the businesses. But at some point, I think the community is going to come back to you and say, stop, enough's enough. And then we would listen your, to you and change yeah. it, and it would we'd go the other direction. And your business and your and your committee is made up of the businesses, correct? More, mostly, we, it's open to everybody. It's yeah. open to everybody, it. and we're just like Sam. But the people that participate and attend are the people who want the signs there. Yes, sir. Okay, enough said. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you much. Are there uh, any comments or anything from the, uh, from the audience at this point on any of our subjects? Anything from the, uh, from the committee? Uh, with that, then I will adjourn the uh, land use committee for today.